welcome. Uh, we have a full agenda tonight and a great speaker, so I will um, kick us off this evening. Thank you for joining us. Uh, this is the second speaker in our six-part series entitled The Start of Change Addressing Racism. Uh, I'm Lauren Patterson. I serve as the president and CEO of the New Canaan Community Foundation, and I am here representing our co-hosts tonight, uh, along with the New Canaan Library, the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society, the Interfaith Council of New Canaan, Grace Farms Foundation, and the Be Kind Foundation. We join together with another dozen local organizations that are standing behind this important conversation in our community. Uh, we are so pleased to see many new names tonight and also some returning from last week's great session. Uh, we have over 200 registered tonight and we anticipate others will also engage in the recordings, which is wonderful. Um, as you know, uh, if you've joined us in the past, our speakers over these next few weeks will touch upon the history, the policies, the experiences that are shaping our present day discussions of race and racism in our country and particularly in our community in Connecticut. Uh, we do wanna note though that this shared step in learning is critical so that we have uh, common context and vocabulary and understanding of some of these issues, but we really do think this is just the first step. And we really hope that you engage with us in uh, planning next steps and, and what action can come from this learning uh, when we conclude this series. So with that, thank you for joining us tonight. And I will hand it over to Nancy Geary, the director of the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society to introduce our speaker. Uh, good evening, everyone. I'm Nancy Geary. I'm the executive director of the New Canaan Museum and Historical Society. I'm honored to be working with many wonderful people, organizations, and institutions in New Canaan to present this series. I want to give a special thanks to the New Canaan Library for hosting. Tonight you will hear the Right Reverend Dr. John Selders Jr., the founder and one of the leaders of Moral Monday, Connecticut. He's an ordained minister, currently Assistant Dean of Students at Trinity College in Hartford, and is slated to join the faculty of Seattle University School of Theology and Ministry as an adjunct faculty member in 2021. Throughout the country, Bishop Selders has lectured on and conducted workshops in the areas of race, oppression, and reproductive justice. He has received numerous citations for his extraordinary work. I know how busy he is right now, and we're especially grateful that he could make the time. Welcome, Bishop Selders. You're on mute. <laughs> So that's the first thing about technology. You got to get it right. You know, okay? uh, I thank you again, Nancy and, and Anthony and Lauren and all the folk um, who are behind the scenes making all of this happen. Uh, I'm so happy and pleased to be here. Um, glad to be uh, in partnership with you. Glad to be in conversation with you. Um, let me tell you a little bit about what I'm, uh, I'm attempting to do. Uh, I was commenting just a moment ago uh, as I was putting together um, the presentation that you will see in just a bit, I asked the question of myself. I said, self, who decided to try to run down the history of this very important subject from 1865 to the present and try to get it done within an hour? That was somebody who was me. So uh, I had to do a little self-talk and and uh, so um, I'm gonna I'm gonna ahead of time say to you, this is just the beginning. This is just the tip of the iceberg. What my uh, attempt is to to highlight um, some some important points in history um, that have to do with race and and, and white supremacy uh, as a concept. Um, and, and, and really located from you know, the mid 19th century and then try to follow it through uh, today. And I'm really speaking of uh, the way it operated here in the United States. Now, while I may reference some other places in the world, I'm talking about how it operates uh, and how it uh, has taken shape uh, and helped to shape policy, uh, our society as a whole, and our practices, both in general and very specific. All right. Uh, so, um, if you would allow me, I'm going to share my screen and um, let's let's get this uh, journey going. Let me 
Where did you go? Okay. Now you should see my screen. Are you seeing my screen? Somebody jump on just for a second, give me a nod. Yes, we can see it. But you, do you see the big screen or do you see the little screen with other stuff on the side? We see, we do see the next slide and the notes along the right hand side. Yeah, that's what I don't want you to see. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so I was having trouble with this before. Hold on just a second. And I'm going to end it. Sometimes I have to reset. So just a minute. Yeah. Voila. There we now go. You, do, you should just see the screen. Looks great. All right. All right. Wonderful. Wonderful. Um, so so a, a, as I begin, um, can I can I offer a, a, at least a some some preliminary uh, conversation about what I am talking about. When I use the term white supremacy, and 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 for the purposes of our conversation today, um, I may use them interchangeably: racism and white supremacy. But I want to be very clear when I'm talking about white supremacy. Eddie Glau um, um, described it or characterized it as this: this idea, the phrase white supremacy conjures up images of, of bad men in hooded robes um, who, who, are, who are destined to believe in, in white power and burn crosses and scream the N-word all around. But, but that's not quite what, what, what uh, Eddie Gloud and or I am talking about. In a broad, this, in the, in a, in a broad sense, um, when I use the term white supremacy, it involves the way in which our whole society has organized itself and it's chosen to value itself. Much like uh, apartheid in South Africa or the Jim Crow South or even Nazi Germany, um, these are clear examples of societies that, that have organized themselves um, by what I am calling white supremacy. In each case, uh, there's a belief that, that white people are valued more than non-white people that then shape every aspect of our society and, and our and social and political life, right? It, it determines how we live, where schools and where we live, uh, what schools we attend, the jobs we have, the, the, the jobs we want to have, um, uh, and, 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 and in, 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 in fact, reminds us daily of the status and stations we have in life. This, this set of assumptions all right, this set of practices, norms, and behaviors that inform uh, um, our fundamental belief. Here's how I want to say it in my way. That somehow white supremacy says that, that some people have value and other people are ascribed less value based on an arbitrary in this case, skin color, all right? So when I'm saying white supremacy, that's what I'm talking about. Um, uh, uh, Robin D'Angelo, who's, who's written a book called um, White Fragility, uh, she names it pretty much in the same way. Uh, she writes, uh, white supremacy captures all the all-encompassing centrality and assumes superiority of people defined and perceived as white and the practices based on those particular assumptions, all right? Um, and what I'm gonna suggest for the purposes of our conversation, the major arm of white supremacy, the action arm of white supremacy is racism. The, 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 this notion that a racial group and their collective prejudgments or prejudices is backed by the legal authority, the power, the institutional control and power that transforms what is believed by that collective group prejudgment 
and their authority and institutionalized reality. That creates what we are calling racism. Um, and, and that's why I want to begin our conversation, just so that I, you're clear how I'm thinking about th this term, these terms, all right? I want to do, before we actually get started at 1865, I need to do a little bit of pre-work because I think what set up what happened at 1865 and beyond um, uh, comes out of this very uh, incident. If you've ever heard of Dred Scott um, uh, and, and Harriet Scott, Dred and Harriet Scott were enslaved people. Um, an interesting fun fact, and I'll have lots of these along the way, but an interesting fun fact, uh, I'm from St. Louis and, and Dred and, and Harriet Scott lived in St. Louis um, in the state of Missouri. Missouri was a uh, slave holding state. So people, slavery was active and legalized in Missouri. Uh, and uh, their entry into the Union uh, came um, via what is called the Missouri Compromise. The Missouri Compromise was that Missouri came in uh, as a uh, slave state, while Maine, here in New England, came in as a free state, thereby keeping the balance of the, 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 the states from the South and the North, free states, and enslaved persons states, all right? And so the, the, the story of the Dred Scott decision in case is a rather involved one. I know it very well. Um, suffice it to say that um, Dred was, and Harriet traveled outside of the state of Missouri. They were declared free by their owners. They then re-entered at a point back into the state of Missouri and they were re-enslaved, if you will. And friends put together a, 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 a fund and they prosecuted the case. The case went all the way through the lower courts up to the Supreme Court. And in 1857, um, the, the, the verdict came in, the case was decided, and then Chief Justice Roger Tanney said this in part. He said, and I quote, hold on just a second. He said, we think that, he was speaking of, of people of African ancestry, are not included and were not intended to be included under the word citizen in the Constitution and can therefore claim no rights or privileges which that instrument provides for and secures to citizens of the United States being of an inferior order and altogether unfit to associate with the white race, either in social or political relations, and so far inferior that they, meaning Blacks or African Americans, had no rights which the white man was bound to respect. This is uh, a direct quote from his uh, majority opinion from that court case that was decided at the Supreme Court of the United States. That, in my opinion, set up for us what then um, became very clear, uh, a, 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 a divide in these United States um, and led us into um, what we now call the Civil War, where several of our, um, uh, several states uh, declared themselves separated, and Confeder the Confederacy of America um, was declared, and we had our Civil War. All right, I'm going to keep moving because we got a little ways to go, a little ways to go. Civil War began in earnest in 1861, um, right after the election of Abraham Lincoln and um, was prosecuted and, to, and through 1865. In the middle of um, the war, um, there was a, um, I wanna go back one, in the middle of the war, there was a very interesting thing. The Emancipation Proclamation was uh, signed and became, it was an executive order <laughs> uh, and was signed by President uh, Lincoln uh, and it declared that any African American, any black person in the union was 
was free, right? Declared him free. And uh, in 1863, January 1863, uh, it established what we now call the Emancipation Proclamation and thereby freeing, quote, uh, those enslaved people uh, in, in, in the Union. The, the many historians say that was a, um, uh, a tipping point in the struggle. Uh, and ultimately, in 1865, um, um, the end of the Civil War uh, was declared. And then the 13th, 14th, and 15th Amendment were added to uh, the Constitution of the United States. The 13th Amendment uh, abolished slavery in the United States and its territories. There's one clause I would um, call your attention to is this clause at the very end, the exception that allows servitude as punishment for a crime allows prisons to use inmate labor. I'm going to come back to that, um, hopefully, as time allows. Um, but that, 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 that phrase, this exception, you know, <laughs> some of us would say there's always a loophole somewhere, right? That, that exception there um, uh, becomes, looms large um, in the context of history as we now know it to have. But um, let me continue, let me continue. The 14th Amendment then um, granted to us uh, this phrase, equal protection under the law, all right? And, you know, I, I could wax eloquently about all of this. I'm not an attorney. I'm a preacher and a teacher. But this equal protection under the law uh, um, is an important uh, phrase for lots of different reasons. But it was in, in particular to allow that that those of us who were enslaved could be considered uh, citizens, right? Uh, in, in, in a certain kind of way. And then finally, the 15th Amendment gave the right to vote for those who were uh, formerly enslaved. Let me be very clear, just a caveat, it would gave um, black men the right to vote. Uh, women still didn't have the right to vote, it would take, um, another 50 years um, before that occurred, but that's a lecture of for a different day, all right? And then, so, so, so presumably and allegedly, um, we lived happily ever after, right, in, in the United States. Um, well, I, I would say to you, um, by 10 years, about, but about 10 years, um, it took um, for, what we call reconstruction, where, where Union troops all over the South um, uh, were posted and in place and allowed for the, 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 the expansion of Black people in all manner of uh, society. We had Black senators, Black um, uh, representatives in Congress. They were elected to office. Uh, we had Black mayors. We had black state senators and black state representatives. Um, we had black businesses that began to um, organize themselves and thrive. And um, um, there, was, there were all kinds of stuff going on down south, however, on the other side of the aisle, if you will. And um, all of it came to a kind of a, uh, a screeching halt at the disputed election of Rutherford B. Hayes in 1860, in 1876, there was a contested, there was a con, uh, 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 an election that was contested. There were hanging chads. And ultimately, there was a vote that, that decided Many historians, uh, in fact, a friend of mine, uh, a person I know, um, his name is Eric Forner, wrote a book called The Second Founding. And he speaks about how the Civil War and Reconstruction remade the Constitution. It's a, po um, uh, a Pulitzer Prize winning um, 
book and author. Um, I would recommend his book highly if this, this subject matter interests you. Um, uh, the, the fact of business is Rutherford B. Hayes, a deal was cut and in April 1877, uh, slaves, the last slaves headed north from South Carolina and Louisiana. And that many would say um, that was the end of reconstruction. And from that date to um, 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 in that period of time, uh, there were several things that was, that was going on while reconstruction was, was alive and well. Um, some states began to reconstitute um, themselves and order themselves under what were, were, were then called black codes. We, we a, a hundred plus years earlier, the creation of what were called slave codes um, were, were, were developed state by state, uh, um, really county by county in some cases. Um, but listen to this, listen to this. Those who identified themselves as black, there was a, a one way to tell it, the one drop rule was instituted. Um, <laughs> those who were considered free could gather only if a white person was in the mix. Mm -hmm. And if these free ones, who were most often assumed to be agri agricultural workers, um, their duties were tightly regulated. They were not taught to read. You remember uh, during the enslavement period, uh, blacks, it was Ill illegal for blacks to read. The public accommodations were then segregated, um, public facilities, um, uh, and anybody who was, who, was, who was caught in violation of these rules in some cases and in some states were whipped or branded. All right, very interesting. Reconstruction while there were lots of, of, of fast moving and, and interesting um, uh, growth in, 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 in our society, this was also lurking kind of, I would say, working concurrently along the same path and the same tra tra trajectory. Um, I'm gonna keep pushing down. And then the landmark decision, Plessy versus Ferguson, um, the landmark um, Supreme Court decision that upheld the constitutionality of racial segregation. Here we go, here's the phrase, separate but equal. That's where that doctrine comes from. It was a creation of the Supreme Court, 1896. So we went from 1865, when the Civil War ended and all of the 13th, 14th and 15th Amendment reconstruction the end of Reconstruction occurred about 10, 11, 12 years later, and, 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 and by 20 years after that, a reinscribing of what existed before under a new name, under some new ways of being. We call it Plessy versus Ferguson, separate but equal. Now, I, I'm going to skip some other parts. Um, now, historically, now we're in the beginning of the 20th century. So um, they're, they're um, in her book, The Warmth of the Other Sons, um, uh, Isabel Wilkinson, who is another Pulitzer Prize winning author, um, uh, wrote this book called um, The Warmth of Other Sons. And she spells out the epic story of the, what, what, what some of us refer to as the Great Migration of Blacks from the South into the North. All right. And um, I call that the, the, the beginning of what we now would refer to as urban America in the way we understand it. Urbanization actually um, uh, probably what well, it was birthed in the Industrial Revolution. I'm not here to talk about that. Um, um, with Hartford and, and certainly Connecticut uh, 
having a, 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 a prominent, prominent place in the context of what I'm calling um, uh, industrialization. In fact, uh, I would say and subscribe to the belief that, that Hartford was the jewel city of industrial revolution. We had manufacturers, we were the publishing capital of the world that ergo, um, Harry Beecher Stowe and, and Mark Twain, Samuel Clemens, and him being here, um, and other writers and publishers. It, it was, this place was the bomb. We were booming. And then by the turn of the century, we had, we had built um, uh, or were building at that point all around here and all of what we call a, a, a city, what a city looks like today, today um, probably had some beginnings here with the, 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 the Travelers Building and all of the big, larger, you know, multi-floors, um, office buildings and stuff. Hartford had, and, and New England, had a lot to do with what that looked like. Um, but lurking also was a conversation uh, in black space, in African-American space. And the conversation was between uh, the, 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 the ideologies that were forwarded by um, Booker T. Washington, who was a, um, the head of the Tuskegee Institute, uh, and, and W.E.B. Du Bois, who was um, uh, the father of sociology, um, many we claim today, uh, and was the, probably the first African-American to receive a PhD at Harvard. And they, they were in a major beef about um, how African-Americans coming out of uh, the enslavement period, uh, now coming into the, the, the 20th century, how we should comport ourselves and what were going to be the ways in which African-Americans uh, were going to get their piece of the pie, if you will, who were going, they were going to transition into not just they were coming out of slavery, they were going to become Americans, right? The move north and the great migration uh, occurred in, I'm, I'm going to say, it occurred in three major shifts. And I will point to them as we go along in this kind of historical timeline. Let me just say that it began uh, coming out of, coming out of uh, the enslavement period during the Reconstruction era. Let me just also note the eugenics movement was a interesting movement. And um, many of you may, may or may not know of the eugenics movement, but this movement was, was uh, pioneered by this, this man, Francis Galton. Um, <laughs> it's very interesting. But the, the idea or the concept is that, that, that human beings could exist and the race could be bettered you know, the human race could be better. And in its bestest form, and I know I'm using um, a particular kind of English, in its bestest form, <laughs> uh, it would be represented by white folk. And they, they use science to make that case. Now, you know, today, we, you know, we, we, we would call that a little crackery science. But it was given legitimacy in the academy. And so much so, it was that same science and that same, the foundation of that science that was used by Hitler and Nazi Germany. It was used in Brazil um, uh, to create what they now call today racial democracy. You should look it up, Google it. Um, it's a very interesting uh, um, theory and, and political theory. Um, I, I would take some issue with it, but that's not... Again, that's a, uh, uh, that's a different subject and a different lecture at this time. Let me move on. Let me move on. Now we're in World War I. Woodrow Wilson um, was the president. Woodrow Wilson was a very interesting fella. Uh, World War I, um, yeah, I'm not here to argue the, 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 the tenets of World War I. Let me just say it was... Um, <laughs> In this war, there were black regiments like there have been in all of our wars. There were black regiments, and in fact, there were Native American regiments um, in, in, in World War I. Woodrow Wilson, however, in his White House, fun fact, here's another fun fact. In his White House, he had a, a, a viewing of Birth of a Nation. 
you've never seen Birth of a Nation, the movie Birth of a Nation, uh, I would I would uh, ask you to view it. It it narrates and tells a story that that helps to crystallize a narrative that blacks and in particular black men were violent. Black men were violent and in particular needed to be, uh, 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 they were violent to, towards women in particular, white women. And white men needed to save white women from black men. Um, very interesting. Um, lots of more I can say about that, but Woodrow Wilson um, sponsored and showed that film in his White House. Um, uh, the Northern Migration, as I told you, I decided that it probably began coming out of the enslavement period during Reconstruction, uh, but certainly there was a huge population shift of African Americans from the South to the North uh, coming out of um, the, the First World War into the 1920s. Now remember, this is the Roaring Twenties, uh, where, 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 where lots of things were, were occurring in our society. Uh, modernization had taken place. We had cars, we had cars, we had cars. Um, and, 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 and urban centers be, be began to get really, really big. New York City, Washington, D.C., um, Detroit, Chicago, St. Louis, um, Indianapolis, Kansas City, all benefited, uh, Minneapolis, uh, St. Paul, all benefited from that transfer of populations from the South, from um, the Florida and Georgia and, and North Carolina and South Carolina and Virginia up here to New York, to Boston, uh, uh, Boston, uh, here in Connecticut, New York City, Philadelphia, uh, and Washington, D.C., and all of our towns, you know, our major cities there um, in between. Then, then we get the 1929, 19, um, we had the economic crash, and then we, we move into the Great Depression. And, and, and uh, Franklin Delano Roosevelt was elected president in 1932, and from there, uh, he started to conceive what is now referred to as the New Deal. And so you had the Civilian Conservation Corps, the, the WPA, the, the PWA, the TVA, and all the other uh, alphabet. Um, but, but interesting, if interesting, um, the, the Federal Deposit, um, so the FDIC, uh, you know, I used to, that, here's an aside, I used to hear that uh, in commercials growing, growing up. Uh, on radio, I listened to a lot of radio during the 1950s where, when I was coming along. And um, uh, uh, I, di I didn't quite understand what I now know about all of these, quote, social programs that would develop under the New Deal. Now, can any of us today think what we might do if, if our deposits in the banks were not backed by the federal government? Just a question, I ain't gonna stay there, just drop it along. We had the 1930s, and then we had Pearl Harbor hit us. Um, uh, we, had, we had aggression and war in Europe, uh, prosecuted by the Germans and the Italians. Uh, and then we had war um, um, prosecuted by the Japanese in Korea, China, and, and, and in Asia. And then Pearl Harbor uh, happened to us December 7th. Uh, 1941 day that will live in infamy. I can, I still can hear uh, and see the black and white footage of uh, then President Franklin Delano Roosevelt declaring war, uh, and, and and ultimately uh, prosecuted that war. Uh, he died right near the end of that war. Uh, his then vice president took on um, the presidency. Um, Missouri's claim to fame is that we we only have one president from the state of Missouri, it was uh, Harry Truman. And Harry Truman uh, took on um, prosecuting the end of the war. It was Harry Truman that dropped, that gave, gave the okay for um, the atom bomb to be dropped in, in, in Japan um, and brought a swift end to World War II, at least in the Pacific realm and in the Pacific theater, uh, while um, uh, Hitler and 
um, his bunch uh, were brought to an end in Europe uh, uh, just before that time. The second migration, the second mass movement of, of Blacks and Black folk from the South to the North happened right after uh, the end of World War II. Let me back up. You all heard this song, How You Gonna Keep Them Down On The Farm After They Seen Hurry? Well, that song was actually a very popular song coming out of the end of World War I. What happened in World War II, however, we had a couple of things going on at the same time. Because there was such a buildup um, because of the military industrial complex that, needed, that was needed at the time to prosecute um, a war on two fronts, the, the, the European theater with a little bit of Africa, Northern Africa, and then the Pacific, the Pacific theater. Um, and and we, had, we, had this, we had this huge mass production of all the kinds of stuff uh, we, we, we were growing to learn to depend on. <laughs> who, 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 who can now think of what would we have done without really the mass production of the car? The automobile, the, the 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 notion that cities were not the only place to live for work, that we could move into the suburbs. Hmm. Where now we've had had our young men who were coming back from the war, they needed somewhere to stay until until there was a um, uh, uh, until those suburbs were developed. And so in his book. Richard Rothstein, his book, The Color of Law. It's another book I would recommend very highly that you pick up if this is of interest to you. Uh, he makes the case of how by law and by the government's co-signature, we set up what we now call racial segregation of neighborhoods. I don't have time, I don't have time to tell this story in, in the way that I would want to tell the story. But redlining began in the 1920s, but took its, took its um, huge leap in the 1940s and 50s. Um, um, I, I grew up in St. Louis, and so one of the models for public housing, which is what it was called, uh, uh, was a, a housing project called um, Pruitt and Igo much like the celebrated in Chicago, Cabrini Greens or Robert Taylor Homes. And in New York City, there, there, there were these same kinds of um, developments. They were originally built to house our soldiers, white soldiers. And as those white soldiers were then placed into these cul-de-sacs and these suburban communities, now we don't have a whole lot of that happening here in Connecticut. Connecticut kind of formed in a different way, but in many places, um, in the country, our large metropolitan, uh, our large urban centers, like a Detroit or like a Chicago or even in New York, Levittown, 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 um, um, uh, was one of those, those experiment, those social, I would say a social housing project, uh, social housing experiment um, that, that actually turned bad for us. Uh, and for African Americans, and was the seat of how how white supremacy operated, how racism uh, took hold, um, to the point that by the 1950s, we we started to see what we have now referred to as white flight. So that these communities uh, that were once populated by Italians and and and, and uh, uh, Jewish folk. Uh, and, 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 and Portuguese and, 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 and other ethnic groups um, became now these enclaves of um, people of color and poor people uh, in, in particular. It's a fascinating, fascinating study. I don't have time to, to go down as, as, as deep as I, I feel it and as passionate as I am about that story, but just wanted to introduce it. In, in 1948, finally, um, Harry Truman integrated the armed forces. Uh, and, and we started the first, here's another fun fact, the first March on Washington, uh, led by a, a younger um, <laughs> um, 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 uh, person 
um, Baird Rustin, who was the, the architect of the 1963 March on Washington, led a March on Washington uh, for jobs and justice, just like the one in 1963, uh, in 1948. Um, uh, Aphid Randolph, who asked Dr. King in, in, the, in the 63 context, hey, uh, Martin King, Dr. King, um, Baird knows how to do this. I think he ought to lead this effort. And um, ultimately, the leaders decided um, Baird Rustin would know how to do it. Now, uh, quietly, Baird Rustin was a gay man, a black gay man. So that, that became, a, that was an issue in the context of it all. But um, uh, suffice it to say that we were beginning to be on the move. This is 1948. We, we're beginning to be on the move. We're beginning to be on the move. Uh, and then um, three things occurred. Brown versus Board of Education, that landmark court decision in 1954, uh, that, that, that the court ruled unanimously striking down that separate but equal understanding of the law. Now, I'm going to ask you a question. Did the law change? No. I'd submit to you the law didn't change, but how the law was interpreted by the courts changed. We're having a conversation right now about a seat that has now been vacated at the passing of um, uh, Supreme Court Justice uh, Ruth Bader Ginsburg. Very interesting conversation. Just wanted to drop this off uh, for your consideration tonight. Uh, Brown versus Board of Education was, was decided uh, not because a law changed, but the interpretation of the law by the courts changed. I want to also say the 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 tremendous the the tremendous effect in uh, the society of the early 1950s early mid 1950s of Emmett Till's death his mother Mamie Till he's a uh, if you don't know the story um, Emmett Till was down south in Mississippi uh, visiting his family his people he's from Chicago lived in Chicago with his mom he was down south. Um, the story goes, he whistled at a white woman. We don't really know. There's lots of stories about what happened. But ultimately, he was, he was murdered. He was lynched and beatedly, he was um, brutally beaten and then uh, 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 submerged by weights um, into a river and um, uh, was killed. And when he was discovered, his body was shipped back to Chicago. And what his mother did was a brave, solitary act. She allowed for Emmett's body to be pictured in its most grotesque form. And I don't have time to stay here today, but those of you who can and will go, if, if you have the, the opportunity, if you want to, go view the pictures. Uh, that went across the interwebs of the internet. Oh. That was the 1950s. We didn't have that yet. But all of the papers and publications, I can tell you in, in Black communities, um, the Black media took on um, this uh, and championed this. Uh, it, was, um, it was that generation's Michael Brown or Trayvon Martin, if you will. Uh, and and that, that did a lot to, to bring about a kind of awareness, a racial awareness, that something was really wrong in our country. That a 14, 15 year old young man could be killed in such a, in such a, a, a barbarous way. Um, and I contend it was um, Brown versus Board of Education, that landmark court decision, coupled with uh, Emmett Till's death and Mamie Till's courageous uh, stand that created the atmosphere for the Montgomery bus boycott. Um, uh, it was um, December 1st, 1955, Mrs. Parks decided to take a seat on the bus. I don't have time to, to stay right there, but what her simple act and what began as a one day bus boycott became a 381 day consecutive day movement only to be surpassed some of us would say with what happened in ferguson uh, 
and the nearly 400 days of continuous activism in, in and around St. Louis. Uh, but the Montgomery bus boycott brought to public square a um, young man by the name of Martin King. Martin King, young man, he was 26 years old at the time. And he was named the leader of the Montgomery Improvement Association. And um, now history records that that was the beginning of what we call the modern day civil rights movement uh, that led to the passing of, um, we had the March on Washington in 1963. We had the killing of the four little girls in Birmingham, the bombing uh, of them, there all kinds of stuff. We had the freedom rides of 61 and 62. Um, all kinds of stuff. I'm jumping. I'm moving fast. Y'all, y'all, I, I ain't got but 12 more minutes. I got to go. I got to go real fast. So we had Civil Rights um, uh, Act of 1964, Civil Rights, the Voting Rights Act of 1965. Our, our, um, our beloved John Lewis uh, has come before. He was, he, was, he was already famous. He was a speaker with Dr. King um, during the 1963 um, March on Washington. The Voting Rights Act uh, was created. Um, then we had, in this same period of time, the assassinations of President Kennedy. Uh, Malcolm X was killed um, in 1965. Uh, Dr. King, in fact, was assassinated, and, and Robert uh, Kennedy were killed um, uh, April and June of 1968. This nation was, was wrecked uh, by these slaves, these, these men in particular, supported by uh, a whole cadre of individuals and peoples, um, important part of, of the, the racial story uh, is, is embedded in these names. I don't have time to deal with it, um, but, but who became president was Lyndon Baines Johnson. Uh, and Lyndon Baines Johnson created a version of the New Deal. He called it the Great Society. I contend that the, the, the creation of um, lots of what we now know and take for granted uh, in our government, in our society. Uh, it was um, President Johnson who forwarded the, those things. Um, uh, it, he, he was the first person to actually, uh, in, within the context of the government, um, do, do uh, affirmative action. It ultimately was signed by Richard Nixon in, in, uh, in 69, but the original act uh, uh, was 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 signed by executive order <laughs> um, by J um, President Johnson. But the the war on poverty, um, federal programs like Medicaid, Medicare, um, the education, uh, secondary and, and, and elementary education act of '65, um, HUD was created in 1965. You see, you see these are, these are programs and and government you know programs that we we know today. We know today um, uh, the motor vehicle air you know, pollution control act, um, lot, consumer product safety commission was created. Um, uh, the immigration and naturalization act. These are all happened uh, federal programs that happened under um, the Johnson administration. While all of that was going on, we had the Vietnam War. I ain't got time to stay there, but black people was all involved in the Vietnam War. It was so. Um, important that Dr. King came out um, in opposition to the war. And many would say it was when he did that in his famous speech, April 4th, 1967, one year, one year to the day when he declared he was um, beyond, he was beyond the, the war in Vietnam. And he named that, that America had the triplets of evil, militarism, materialism, all right, and race. All right, he, he, he said, that's, if we don't get this right, that would be the downfall of our society as we know it. Um, uh, then we get, we get the war on drugs. Um, again, after the assassination of Dr. King and, and um, Robert Kennedy, um, President Nixon showed up on the scene. I need to, I need to drop this little piece of word. Um, John Erdman, you those of us who remember, um, um, Watergate and all that, his name is familiar. But what he now, you know, in retrospect, in an in a, in a, uh, in a interview in 2016, he tells us that, listen to this, listen to this. He said, he said that, listen, we understood that in order for us during the Nixon campaign, in order for us to win, 
we had to do two things. We had to, we had to, we had two enemies. He said, we had the, the, the anti-war left and black folk. <laughs> all right. So what we needed to do, all right. Uh, we, we couldn't, he said, we knew we couldn't make it illegal to be either against the war or against blacks. But by getting the public to associate the hippies with marijuana and blacks with heroin and then criminalizing both heavily, we could disturb these communities. We could arrest their leaders, raid their homes, break up their meetings, vilify them night after night on the evening news. Did we know we were lying about the drugs? He said, of course we did. I want to suggest to you that's a vestige of white supremacy. This idea that you can that that you can tell a lie and then say it as if it's the truth, get people to believe it, and create policy, hmm. public policy out of it. I gotta keep going, I gotta keep going. Um Cointel Pro uh, um, was another program that 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 got its it was really enacted uh under uh, President Eisenhower in the 1950s but really took shape in the 19, late 1960s and 70s where they surveilled. Dr. King was a part of this surveillance and other Mark, uh, Malcolm was, was, was surveilled. In, in, in part, it was the counterintelligence program. That's the short of COINTELPRO. And again, another vestige of what I wanna call uh, white supremacy racism. Uh, when I talked about affirmative action, uh, uh, President Nixon ultimately signed it. And, and again, it was an executive order, executive order. Just want to talk about that. I ain't got time. To, but here's a trajectory. Here's a trajectory that leads us into what we now have. The war on drugs became the, the, the anthem and the cry, let's get tough on crime. Remember, that was Nixon. Nixon was, was, uh, began that phraseology, and it took from the late 1960s into the 70s and up into the 80s and the early 90s it led us through to what we call mass incarceration. Now, remember the, the 13th Amendment and that phrase, that servitude phrase? I believe there's a direct connection between how that was situated in the 13th Amendment to what we have now. The largest increase, of, and, and I can talk about President Carter, he began um, foreign surveillance, very sticky stuff here, very sticky stuff around foreign powers and electronic surveillances and all that kind of stuff. I ain't got time to deal with it right now. But, but, but under President Reagan and his administration, some very interesting things. The privatization of prisons occurred. The abolition of the parole and mandatory minimums began, began to take shape. We had, we had now sentencing reform in 1984. Very, very interesting that led us <coughs> into the major big old crime bill that I will say on this platform here tonight that was supported by then Senator Joseph Biden. But I'm gonna keep moving, I'm gonna keep moving. Uh, uh, many of us would say this was huge in the African-American space. I'll tell you a personal note, I have a younger brother who's 12 years younger than me and he has now spent 25 years of his life in prison. He is in prison today because of three strikes you're out and mandatory sentencing. Uh, and he didn't kill anybody. And uh, I think um, in many instances, in, in, in many cases, this hurt the, the movement now, not from the South to the North of black people, as far as population is concerned, but the mass movement of free black men and women and free black uh, brown men and women from the neighborhoods and the communities they lived, worked, and, and served into prisons. Huge, big deal. Um, and then, then we have you know the policies of broken window policing and stop and frisk. All of these are, are, are just policies that, that, that help to frame and, and, and codify what I believe were, were are things that help to highlight this difference that, that, that white supremacy makes. The statement is that there, that, that there is something, or, you know, there's something different about us and it's based on skin color, that some people are valued and some people have less value. Some people are valued and some people have less value. Um, 
I, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to skip through some of this stuff. Um, I, what I will say about the presidency of uh, 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 President Barack Hussein Obama, Black Lives Matter started under President Obama. Um, um, yeah, the housing bubble, I, you know, um, the uh, 2013, the Supreme Court decision that struck down a big old part of, of the Voting Rights Act of 1965, which we're still, um, some of us are trying to get restored. Um, um, yeah, it, 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 it was a huge deal. This same year, Trayvon Martin was, was killed. Uh, and um, the, the, the person that was accused of killing him uh, was ultimately charged but not convicted. And in a tweet and in social media, uh, three African-American women from the Bay Area uh, used the hashtag Black Lives Matter. And it wasn't until 2014 um, uh, that what I would suggest uh, Black Lives Matter got legs and became a thing, it became a movement that I believe in much the same way that, that Emmett Till's death uh, uh, moved this country and this nation. Um, uh, Black Lives Matter has allowed us to be in a conversation on race and racial justice in a powerful way. I'm gonna stop here and I got it done within about an hour. All righty. Thank you very much for listening. Thank you, Bishop Selders, um, so much for condensing and um, flying through a really rich history uh, of more than 150 years very quickly. Um, if folks do want to stay on for any particular questions, um, we can go a bit past 8 p.m. So um, please use that Q&A feature. Um, I know there's at least one question here so far about the book recommendations. Um, we'll, we can follow up with Bishop Selders after this and make sure that goes out in a follow-up email to everyone, uh, if any of those interested, uh, interested you. Uh, we do have a question asking about elaborating on the GI Bill. Yeah, so, so very interesting. Um, what the GI Bill, uh, many white folk uh, today can point to, and white families in particular, can point to uh, the establishing of the GI Bill, the, the ability to get a loan you know, at, 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 at low uh, mortgage and uh, interest rates. Uh, at, at, and, and the GI Bill that allowed uh, soldiers co coming back from the war to go to school, go to college, um, um, helped to create this, this, this different, you remember I, I referenced um, um, the, the industrialization uh, of America, the shift and the migration into our urban centers and the creation of suburbs. Well, this was all happening all at the same time, right? Uh, and and um, we know now that most families and their wealth comes through property ownership and home ownership and how that gets passed down from one family and one generation to the next generation. That, the GI Bill was an extremely helpful uh, and extremely important um, product of a society that did not necessarily benefit in the same way it benefited whites. It did not benefit blacks and other persons of color. Okay. Uh, and and, and um, I think um, there's a book by Debbie, and I'm blanking on her last name, um, uh, that tells this story in earnest. Um, um, White Like Me or something like that. Some, there's a book, somebody will, will reference it um, and, and, and if you let me think for a minute, this is the product of getting old, um, getting older, but if you let me think for a minute, I'll pull up the book and, um, uh, and reference it. And it's something that if you're interested, you should read a bit more about. Debbie Irving, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I knew somebody knew. Um, there is a good question. Today is National Voter Registration Day. Uh, could you speak a little bit about the importance of the Voting Rights Act and what's at stake now with gerrymandering and voter suppression? Yes. So if it was that important for our founding fathers to, to create in our founding documents the idea that Black people, listen to this now, were three-fifths human, three 
fifth human. That's codified in, in our founding documents. Um, the, the, the vote was important. Uh, I, I've heard uh, often, you know, why should I vote? Because it's all, you know, it's all hogwash. And I say, well, you know, it was important to our founding fathers and it was important to uh, the establishment of this, this government and our society that we, we revisited the vote, especially the black vote, <laughs> about every 100 years. You know, so you get the founding of our nation in 1776, 1780, something by 1792, we got a president and all that stuff started happening, right? Then, then in, in, in 1870, we restored, quote, the vote for black people in the 15th Amendment. Then we got a Voting Rights Act in 1965, 100, almost 100 years later. And then 50, 60 years later, we gut the biggest portion of it, the most strongest or the teeth of that voting rights act. The vote is important. Let me say this right uh, quick. The most important thing and one of the most important things that we can say as a citizen, how do you say I'm a citizen? You declare it. I think the example of a citizen is in and invested in the power of the vote. It is one real tangible way we name and we declare, we, we, we hold on to a kind of truth. I'm a citizen because I can go and vote my ticket. So go, go out to vote. I, I don't really care who you vote for. I do care, but I don't care. Uh, in, in the larger, scheme of things, what I want you to do is to participate in the democratic process. We call it the democratic process, although I would probably argue um, we're in a democratic republic. But anyway, uh, anyway, I, I won't argue that again. Uh. <laughs> Could you um, elaborate a little bit on the language that you use? So um, folks noted that you refer to enslaved peoples rather than slaves. Yes, I'm a human being and my ancestors we're humans, all right? Enslaved people, people, persons. They were, they were not plantations. They were work camps. You hear it kind of subtle, but it, it actually tells the truth of what it was. So that's, uh, I, 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 I'm intentional about not calling my ancestors slaves as if they were a thing. They were enslaved people. They were persons. They had mamas and daddies. They had hopes and dreams. They had, they, they had real lives. They ate real food. Mm -hmm. They built this country for free, free 99, free work for nearly 300 years. And don't get it twisted. We had slavery here in Connecticut. Let's don't, let's don't get that twisted up. There was slave. We didn't have the big work camps, <clears throat> but we had slavery. And uh, I, can't, I can't stay that long either, but I'd love to talk about it because it's a very interesting, it's a very interesting conversation to have uh, about what our version of slavery was here in Connecticut and in New England. Well, and luckily, this is a good segue. So we, um, we did have a speaker, uh, Professor Justine Hill Edwards, last week, speaking on the history of slavery in New England. Um, and uh, I will just put a plug in that next week she's returning and talking specifically about um, race and wealth and economic inequality uh, in our country. So um, thank you so much, Bishop well, Selders, for joining us tonight. And I'm sure um, we haven't gotten to all of the questions, um, but uh, if folks want to connect, please reach out to us. Uh, and uh, thank you all for joining us. Good night. Good night. <laughs>